you were probably taught at school that in the middle of the 14th century, the Black Death, a form of bubonic plague, swept across Europe for the first time, killing upwards of 30 million people. It was caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis and was carried by fleas living on rats. While this is still the version of history taught in most schools, there's a second and very different theory about the Black Death that fits the historical facts much more closely, and it's a theory that should worry us all. In 1894, the Swiss-born bacteriologist Alexandra Yersin identified the bacteria that caused bubonic plague. He was working in Hong Kong on behalf of the Pasteur Institute, investigating a current outbreak of bubonic plague there, when he found a new bacterium present in both humans and rats, both of whom had the disease. He immediately made a connection between the bubonic plague he was studying and the great pestilence of the 14th century, because the buboes of bubonic plague large swollen lymph glands found near the initial infection site, sounded very much like some of the historical descriptions of the medieval disease. Because of this, he named the bacterium Pastorella pestis, after Louis Pasteur, and the great pestilence of the 14th century. He also showed conclusively that the bubonic plague that he was studying was transmitted to humans by flea bites. His assumptions were generally accepted to be accurate, and are still widely taught today the medieval Black Death, and the bubonic plague were one and the same. In 1944, Pastorella pestis was renamed Yersinia pestis, in honour of the man credited with discovering it. However, there have always been a number of academics who felt that bubonic plague, a disease that still exists today, didn't really fit the historical facts. Professor Chris Duncan from Liverpool University and social historian Sue Scott are convinced that Yersin's original assumptions were wrong, and it's hard to dispute their reasoning. There is no doubt that bubonic plague in humans is caused by fleas leaving infected rats and biting their new host. However, bubonic plague is also often fatal to rats, and in the modern era, outbreaks of bubonic plague have been presaged by large numbers of dead rats suddenly being seen. As the fleas leave their former hosts, the disease travels to their new host, often humans. In about 5% of cases of human bubonic plague, the disease affects the lungs, and then, and only then, can the infection be passed from person to person. This is known as pneumonic plague, and it cannot occur without first being bubonic plague. If there are no rats, there is no bubonic plague. In 1347, when the first cases of the Black Death in Europe were seen, it was immediately recognised that it was directly infectious. Human-to-human -human transmission was well documented. One contemporary writer described how every single person who had any contact with the disease went on to die. As soon as this was realised, people fled. But this only served to spread the disease. Within the space of two and a half years, the disease had spread through all of Europe, it had a case mortality rate of 100%. If you developed symptoms, then you died. Your only hope was not to catch it in the first place. It was quickly realised that a long quarantine was the only hope of stopping the disease, with a period of 40 days being settled on by most countries. England did not adopt an official quarantine and sadly suffered greatly because of it. By the time Daniel Defoe was writing about the Black Death in 1665, it was fully understood that people could be spreading the disease for some time before they developed any symptoms. In his own words, the disease may be spread by apparently healthy people who harbour the disease but have not yet exhibited the symptoms. Such a person was in fact a poisoner, a walking destroyer, perhaps for a week or a fortnight before his death. Some historical records are good enough that a number of outbreaks can be traced back to a specific individual, a person who brought the disease with them despite seeming to be symptom-free. The dangers of infected travellers were well known, and many urban areas simply refused entry to anyone travelling from the direction of a known outbreak. 
if a person's bitten by an infected flea and contracts bubonic plague, they are not infectious to others. And even in the modern world, they tend not to be isolated for treatment. The incubation period of bubonic plague is two to six days, and the characteristic symptom, the telltale one that allows diagnosis, is the formation of the bubo. If no treatment is given, sufferers will develop a high temperature, severe pain, and often become confused. Somewhere between 30 and 50% of those people will die. Those that make it to day seven after onset of symptoms usually recover. Clearly, this does not fit the historic pattern. The historical records show a disease that had a latent period post-exposure of 12 days. That's almost two weeks while the disease is multiplying inside you without any sign at all. Then it had an asymptomatic infectious period of up to 20 days. You'd still have no idea you were infected, but you'd be passing the disease on to everyone you saw. And then your symptoms would start. They'd last up to six days before you would inevitably die. But the evidence is far stronger than just contemporary writers. The brown rat, the dominant species in Europe, was not introduced to the UK until the 1700s, and the black rat, which was already established, tends not to stray from its home. The speed of transmission of the Black Death does not fit the behaviour of the native rodent species. The great pestilence of the 14th century travelled 40 times faster than a disease carried by black rats ever could. There are no contemporary accounts of large numbers of dead rats coinciding with outbreaks of the disease, and unlike in some areas of Asia where bubonic plague is still to be found, there are no resistant species of rats in Europe. On top of this, there were two well-documented outbreaks of the Black Death in Iceland during the 15th century. There were no rats present on the island. So, if we accept that the Great Pestilence, the Black Death, was not the bubonic plague, then what was it? It was a disease that had a case mortality rate of 100%. It caused headaches, chest pain, vomiting and diarrhoea, an extreme high temperature, widespread bruising, bleeding from the nose and eyes, and if it hadn't killed you within three days, blisters, carbuncles and buboes. Contemporary autopsy reports describe necrosis and general breakdown of internal organs. All of these symptoms, the pattern of transmission, and the measures that successfully dealt with the disease, fit the pattern of a different type of illness altogether a viral hemorrhagic fever. But there are no known diseases today that present with the symptoms of a viral hemorrhagic plague of this nature. Those that are closest are Ebola and Marburg virus. The problem with these is that there are no real treatments for them and no effective vaccines. And even these, deadly though they are, are less severe than the Great Pestilence was. But the last outbreak of the Black Death was in 1665, 356 years ago. It's possible that the disease burnt itself out. It's possible that it's still out there, but that the majority of Europeans have a degree of natural immunity. But it's just as possible that the virus is still out there, harmlessly biding its time, waiting for humans to come into contact with it once more.